Good morning. Um, decided to do this video because I wanted to share a couple of things that I I, um, I thought was important with managing these patients with COVID um, nineteen infection. Um, not there's really no need to go again and do the background of the the virus. We all know the the nature of the virus, being that it's uh, this is not the first time we we've seen a coronavirus cause an epidemic or a pandemic in this case. Um, but really, you know, the fact that a small section of the patients that are infected by this virus end up in the hospital, and if a small fraction of those patients might require intensive care, it's important to kind of get uh, some form of some form of guidance or some form of structure in terms of how we we manage this patient. Sadly, there's not much evidence yet as to what is required to treat these patients. Uh, but again, we're, we're picking up things as we go. We're, we're, we're taking them one day at a time. Um, so typically when these patients come in, um, the symptoms should you know, be able to you know, spark your, your thought regarding, regarding um, the, the diagnosis of COVID or the need to put the patient as a patient under investigation uh, for COVID. So typically, we know that fever is most common in most of these patients. Uh, they typically present with fever. Um, some of the common symptoms would be things like you know fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, cough. Obviously, cough would definitely be right there with fever. Myalgias is also a thing that tends to be common with these patients. So when you see these symptoms, um, whether it's fever, you know, cough, myalgia, fatigue you obviously start to think it's some form of viral upper respiratory tract infection. But again, now that we're in a pandemic, everybody has to start thinking COVID because of the risks of you know, infection. And if we don't employ the, uh, the appropriate infection prevention and control, it just becomes a mess from there. So having said that, you see these patients that come in, um, not all of them have to be admitted. Uh, for patients with mild symptoms, for example, they typically can be treated at home. Um, again, mostly supportive treatment. But for patients that are considered high risk, so that would be patients, for example, uh, above the age of 70, because we know that the case fatality rate in these groups of uh, patients is much higher. Uh, you have patients with multiple comorbid com uh, conditions, uh, like cardiovascular disease it tends to be more common in patients with severe infection. Uh, diabetes is another very, another very common one in patients with severe infection, uh, chronic lung disease, COPD, asthma, um, hypertension, uh, cancers as well. So we're saying older patients, more than 70, uh, we're saying patients with a lot of comorbid, uh, comorbid conditions, we're saying also patients with immun immunocompromised, all right? So these patients will be co also considered high risk and it's important to, to admit these patients because they they, they tend to worsen very rapidly. Um, some of the things you might find, for example, on the labs or some of your initial evaluation that might suggest that you keep these patients in the hospital will be, for example, if patient is making troponins, um, if you know chest x-ray obviously shows signs of bacterial pneumonia or some form of pneumonia whatsoever. Um, obviously, if they're hemodynamically unstable, you definitely won't be able to send that kind of a patient home. If the patient is hypoxic and hypoxic respiratory failure, um, that would be another reason to keep uh, these patients um, in the hospital. Uh, so, you, 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 you hear the initial symptoms, you look at the patient and you say, you know, you make a decision as to whether they're high risk for severe COVID infection. You make a decision about keeping them in the hospital. So you then now talk about um, two things. Um, we talk about infection prevention and control and the diagnostic workup. The reason why I'm bringing infection prevention and control early is because the moment you deem a patient, a patient on the investigation for COVID, you have to institute these things right away because, you know, if they're exposed to other people, it just goes on and on. So it's important to make that decision early and put the appropriate precautions. Typically, contact and droplet precautions would be uh, uh, deemed appropriate for these patients. Uh, but then in certain cases, you might also want to put airborne precautions uh, when you're doing things that might generate aerosolization, whether you have to intubate the patient, if you're suctioning the patient, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Having said that, you know, every 
every staff that is going to encounter this patient has to wear the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, you know, where you have your gowns, you have your gloves, you have your face mask. There's the N95 respirators are, are definitely um, indicated in this case. You need eye shields, for example, so you don't have entry of the drop dropper through those avenues. Um, and obviously something to cover your, your head. Um, so that's one, infection prevention and control, you know, make sure the patient is protected, uh, you know, the appropriate precautions for the patient from, prevent, from infecting everybody else and the appropriate precaution, uh, um, precaution for yourself, to, you know, to prevent you from getting um, exposed to that particular pathogen, to COVID, uh, as, as, as it is. So having said that, now you have to start thinking about diagnostic workup. So some of the initial things we typically would do would be to get a complete blood count uh, with differentials because we know that many of these patients tend to have a leukopenic uh, slash lymphopenic pattern. Um, so that might tend to push us in that, uh, in that, in that direction. Obviously a complete uh, metabolic panel would definitely be ideal um, because some of these patients also have some um, hepatic enzyme uh, dysfunction, so you have elevated transaminases and, and all of that. Um, you also want to get a lactate, so you make sure you know if there's any evidence of sepsis in these cases, you want to identify early and basically just introduce a sepsis protocol. Um, you also want to send things like your LDH or lipase. Um, creatinine kinase might be useful. Um, maybe some of the inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP, it, it doesn't hurt to send these things just to help you create a better uh, picture. Troponins are also another one. If you have a patient having cardiac symptoms uh, or they have EKG changes that suggest there was something going on you know, in the heart or um, uh, the, the patient that's just high risk for cardiovascular complications of COVID, you might want to send troponin uh, because if it's elevated, it might point you towards you know, things often missed, you know, accompanying diagnosis such as viral myocarditis, which is really, really fatal. And I have a suspicion that that might be tied to some of the sudden deaths associated with these cases. Um, you also want to do a chest x-ray, obviously, um, which would typically would show you bilateral uh, patchy infiltrates. And a lot of times it doesn't really tell you much. If you have a chest x-ray that's not telling you that much, it might be indicated to actually do a CT scan. Some people say just standard of care, you should do a CT scan by default. But again, it may vary in institution. Um, having said that, uh, what else are we looking at now? So I mentioned most of the labs, you know, obviously get an EKG, it's important, get a chest x-ray, and then your swabs, all right? You want to do influenza, influenza swab first. If, if you, you typically don't want to wait for the influenza swab to come back before you start testing for COVID. If, you can, if you're, you're concerned that this might be COVID, you send both swabs at the same time. I think it's appropriate that way. So having said that, you then... I'm just waiting now to get the results back. If you're lucky in your institution, the turnover is, is much faster than you can you know, swing into action early. Um, but if not, it might take a couple of days and you have to wait for the results to actually actively be able to treat. But you know, some of the guidance we're getting is that if you have high clinical suspicion, it doesn't hurt to actually start treating. Um, there's no clear evidence for most some of the medications that we use in terms of uh, in COVID, um, uh, most of what we tend to start with will be broad spectrum antiviral agents, um, such as now we're starting to find the antiviral properties of drugs like chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. So that's coming more and more, uh, more is is being recommended more and more. Um, then there's this other combination between ritonavir and lopinavir um, that people suggest has broad anti antiviral um, uh, functionalities, but Sadly, a study came out yesterday that's saying it's, it's difficult to really say or it's, it's, they weren't able to tell any benefit over standard therapy. Um, but again, that study, uh, it's, it's still pretty early. You probably would need more studies to be able to say for sure that it doesn't work. But again, at this time, we're just throwing everything we can at these patients to give them their best chance. So again, chloroquine is, is, is important, um, lutonavir, lopinavir. Yesterday, by the way, a non-randomized uh, um, study came out as well that now says chloroquine, 
and um, uh, azithromycin combination tends to reduce significantly the, the viral shedding in these patients. And basically that just correlates with the fact that the drugs are working to actually get rid of the virus. So as, as, as part of standard care now, we're starting to have patients right, right away on hydroxychloroquine, right away on azithromycin. Um, the other antiviral agents is, is still very debatable. Remdesivir is another uh, broad spectrum antiviral agents um, that might be useful. Most of these things were initially studied in vitro, uh, but now there's a, a lot of clinical trials just you know popping out regarding actually you know treating using them in, in these patients. Um, so I said hydroxychloroquine azithromycin is, is definitely one of the ones the, one of the, the combinations that are that tends to be the best. Or well, with the sort of you know efficacious. Uh, 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 properties and uh, uh, some evidence as well. Um, it's also important to know that some of these patients might have superimposed or co-infection with, with uh, bacterial pneumonia. So if you're suspicious of pneumonia, it, it doesn't hurt to actually treat for bacterial pneumonia because if that is, a, is part of the picture, it just messes it up and it's, it's better to actually, to actually take care of that. Um, so treating bacterial pneumonia is important in these patients. Um, what else, what else, what else? Um, again, you have to think of the associated clinical diagnosis such as you know, sepsis, septic shock, you have to be able to identify that early. ARDS is something you have to identify early so you can, you can you know, swing into action as early as possible. Hypoxia, you know, when the patient is hypoxic, you should get an ABG to be able to give you a better picture of their hypoxia and you know, put the clinical picture together. If this is ARDS, you have to swing into that action. Um, you also have, again, like I said, you shouldn't, you shouldn't forget the possibility of viral myocarditis. That's something you should, you should also think about. Um, where else? So the other clinical diagnosis that may be missed, um, again, I mentioned bacterial pneumonia. You don't want to miss that and not treat for that. Um, PCP pneumonia, for example, in a patient with HIV uh, with CD4 less than 200, you know, could present very similarly, and you don't want to miss that as well. Uh, you don't want to miss viral myocarditis. You don't want to miss septic shock, ARDS. Um, you don't want to miss a PE, for example, in these patients. So it's important to put all that clinical picture together. Again, we're in the early phase of actually finding data to su support a lot of these things that we're doing. But it's an ongoing process. You know, I'm obviously still studying and getting to know what's going on, really. And a lot of people are basically just, you know, trying their best to find out what really helps these patients. It's real. There's no denying the fact that these patients can actually get very sick. And even though we have high-risk patients, sometimes you have patients that may not necessarily be considered high-risk that are getting really sick. So it's important for everyone, you know, to be a part of this uh, resolution in terms of, you know, if you have to stay stay at home, if you don't have any reason to be out of your house, you know, just, just respect that. The, the, the better the earlier we come together and make strong, strong uh, decisions when it comes to actually fighting the, dis the disease, the earlier we get out of it and hopefully we'll all be soon enough. I'll see you guys next time.